take our Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. As you're turning there, I've got a couple things I want to say. We sang that song, O Zion Haste, and uh, whew, had to preach on tears this morning, brother, thanks. <laughs> when I think of this song, I think of missions. It's good to have the Shrocks here, Dave and Gina, and our missionaries to Belarus. Of course, Byron and Judy are heading out this week. Zambia. I am jealous. That last verse, it says, let's take this as a challenge. Give of thy sons to bear the, the message glorious. Give up thy wealth to speed them on their way. Pour out thy soul for, for them in prayer victorious, and all that thou spendest, Jesus will repay. There's a few things in life that are going to matter more than reaching people with the gospel. And, um, yeah, especially when you get to go to some places where they're just waiting for you. I said, brother, I'm jealous. Anybody interested? There's a town. I could take you several towns. There's a town, very nice town called Mazabuka in Zambia. Still waiting for an independent Baptist missionary to go and start a church. And many, many other places. It's been a blessing to see uh, how people in our church are excited about um, the soul winning emphasis weekend. Uh, again, the huge turnout, the, the uh, chapel was packed yesterday. We had a couple hundred people in there. It was just packed. And that was a blessing. And then uh, just, just people getting excited about it and looking forward to seeing God do something special with just our focus, our attention on souls. Um, let me just throw this out too, just a clarification. Uh, if you're taking that, um, if you're involved with the soul winning course, there are the materials, we're not going to have them here now. They're all down in the bookstore. So if you need any of that, you can get the course down there. And a clarification on the, the CD. It's not a CD. It's, it's a CD, yes, but they're MP3 files on the CD. So you're not going to just be able to pop it in a regular CD player and, and listen to all the, the lessons. They're MP3 files, so you can load them on your computer, play them on your computer, download them uh, from your computer, on your personal devices or whatever. Anyway, there you go. Second Timothy chapter number two. I really believe this is the message that God has for us tonight. Uh, I'm excited about God's word. We gave a challenge uh, yesterday about just making sure that we're focused on souls. This morning we covered how to win a soul in the Sunday school hour and gave some tips on that. And then we were challenged about having a passion for souls in the morning service by uh, Pastor Smith. Tonight I wanted to cover something else. Because sometimes we're just not at this thing of soul winning. And I want to talk about why that is. Or why it, it might be in your life and why it is sometimes has been in my life. We're going to pick it up here in 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Begin in verse number 1. Thou therefore, this is Paul speaking to Timothy, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love, your faithfulness to us, and I thank you for your word and how clear it is and how you lead and guide us as we study your word to apply it to our lives and to uh, our, our individual circumstances and even to us as a church. And I believe, Lord, there's some truths in here that could really help us. I and mean, I pray that we get some victories tonight 
And because of these victories, we could be more effective servants for you. Again, I need wisdom. I need power. I need your strength. I pray you prepare each heart to receive something from you. And I pray you be glorified. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Paul told Timothy to be strong, to endure hardness, and to be a good soldier. We're all called, all of us who are saved are called to be soldiers engaged in advancing Christ's kingdom. This is, uh, we do this by fulfilling the Great Commission. All right, I remember my brother, he was, a, he was an enlisted serviceman, and then when he got out, he changed branches and went into the, uh, the National Guard, and he wanted to be an infantry officer. So he went through the officer's candidate uh, program and became an officer uh, that way. And he received, when you become an officer, you receive a commission. All right? Now, an infantry officer is not necessarily going out there to save lives. <laughs> He's going out to take lives of the enemy. Our commission that God has put us in as soldiers of Jesus Christ is to not to take people's lives, but to rescue them from, from the devil, rescue them from sin. We're out to save souls, not in our own power, but in God's strength. And the goal of every Christian ought to be to please the one who has chosen him to be a soldier. We're supposed to be a soldier. Part of that means we're going to endure hardness. It's going to be difficult. Life isn't easy. You think, you know, well, I get saved, all my problems are going to go away. No. In fact, you get some new ones just because you're a Christian. Whoa. But then we also get a bunch of promises that help us through, through it. And God has a plan for us. He has, a, he has activity for us. He has work for us. And he wants us to get involved. And a lot of times we just kind of bebop through life and we're not engaged in doing what he wants us to do. It's because we forget that we're in a warfare. Soldiers are in a warfare. You know, the Marine Corps gets a lot of people by those dress blues. <laughs> they get some of these young guys say, oh, I want to look like that. You only look like that when you put on the dress blues. Most of the time, you're not in the dress blues. You're out in the trenches. You're out sweating. You're out running. You're out packing. You're out doing all sorts of things. Not what you thought. In, in many cases, right? But the Great Commission is given to all of us, and we're, and we're not always on the front lines. We're not always soldiering. Why is that? Why is it that sometimes you and I don't witness as we should? Can I remind you that the devil is a real foe? And he wants to injure and sideline God's children. He doesn't want us on the battlefield. Boy, the enemy. In, in, in real-time war, the enemy wants to take out as many soldiers as they can. And the devil's the same way. And we forget. We get so focused on the things of this world. And that's why the Lord said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. We get so focused on the world, we're coveting, and we're wanting, and we're striving, and we're distracted, and we're not engaged in the battle because all of these things take our attention. And we forget what we're here for. We're in a spiritual battle, a real spiritual battle, and there's a lot more going on in life than meets the eye. We're going to come back to 2 Timothy, but if you would, please turn with me to 2 Kings chapter number 6 is a great example of this. 2 Kings chapter number 6. The king of Assyria... Wasn't real happy with the prophet Elisha, and he wanted to capture him. And so we'll pick it up here. The second Kings, chapter number 6, verses 13 through 17. And he said, go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it, and it was told him, saying, behold, he is in Dothan. So Elisha was down there in Dothan. Therefore he sent thither horses and chariots and a great host. Now this is just a prophet and his servant. 
and you're going to send a bunch of chariots, a bunch of horsemen. You're going to send a whole army after this guy? And they came by night and compassed the city about. So they, they, had, they had circled the entire city just to capture the prophet. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? He's like, whoa, guess what? There's a bunch of people out there, and they're coming for us. In common vernacular, we're dead meat. In verse 16, and he answered, fear not. Fear not? What are you talking about, fear not? Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. See, in this servant size, it was Elisha and, and him and a whole bunch of other people out there on the, on the opposing army coming after him. He could only see uh, earthly things. He could only see all those armies and the limited resources that he and Elisha had. That's all he could see. And in verse number 17, and Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. That's a pretty good prayer that we could have for our young people. Lord, open their eyes so they could see what's really going on in life. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. That's what he saw. When he, and so it made a lot more sense. Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And almost, I've heard people uh, suggest that they that be with them, that there was someone else with them. Maybe it's some demonic forces. But they that be with us, we see this in the scripture, there was an, an angelic, heavenly host that was with them. And no matter what the, the forces of darkness have, the forces of light are greater and stronger and more victorious. And we have to remember this. And I just threw this, I just wanted to include this in the message just so that we remember that Life is not just about, you know, us having interactions with people here and there. We know the passage. We, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we sometimes forget these things. I think this passage back here in, in 2 Kings is, is, is just tremendous just to open up to, to see there's more going on out there. And so the devil's a real foe. He really doesn't want us to have a soul-winning emphasis weekend. He doesn't want people going to the mission field. He wants to hinder people from serving him. And we're, we're in a fight. And sometimes we get injured. And sometimes we're sidelined. It's easy to, to still show up for our ministries and just kind of go through the motions. And yeah, I visited in the bus route. And yeah, I went out and knocked on doors. And we did those things, but did we really try to reach people? Did we really uh, have an open heart for God to work through us? How did we do this past week? Did we pass up opportunities to give out a tract or to speak for the Lord or to open our mouths for Jesus? It's more than just fulfilling a, a, a little ministry. I'm all for fulfilling ministries, and I don't, I'm not belittling that, but that's not it. And let me suggest that some of us could be wounded tonight. And that's why we're not witnessing like we should. And I wanted the, the title of the message is Wounded Warriors. Wounded Warriors. Let's address some reasons why we might not be reporting for duty. I'm not saying you're not reporting for the minist your ministries but why we might not be reporting for duty when it comes time to passing that tract out or getting an active or, or writing that letter to that loved one or making a phone call or going and visiting someone that you know God wants you to witness to. That's what I'm talking about tonight. This is where the rubber meets the road. We're not playing church. 
We ought not to be playing church. Sometimes we do. So let's look at this. Let's look at some reasons why we're not reporting for duty, how we could be wounded. And the first one, first reason is this, because we could be scarred by sin. Scarred by sin. You know, sin, a scar will make you uh, insensitive. Did you know that? And sin, you know, the devil loves to scar us with sin. We get into sin and we are scarred. A few things that sin will do to us as it scars us. First, first one is this. Sin makes us unable to serve. We're back here in 2 Timothy. I want you to see this. In verse number 4, it says, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Here, bottom line, if you're entangled with this world, you're entangled with the affairs of this life, you're not serving the Lord as you should, and neither am I. When I grew up in New Hampshire, we had this little mountain in our, it was, I don't know why they called it a mountain, but it was a little hill, and they called it Mount Prospect. It's still there. And there was a, a little um, ski area there. They had three runs. They weren't real steep except for one. It was real short, but it was really steep, and that run was called Suicide. And it, it didn't have a chairlift. It was all volunteer operated. So, you know, different guys in the town would be on the board or in the thing, and they'd just help out and keep this thing going. And so no chairlift, but it had a rope tow. But it was, it was kind of long, so it was long for a rope tow, so it was pretty, you know, heavy rope, and you'd sit there and you'd hang onto that rope, and it'd pull you all the way up the hill. If you don't know about skiing, then you don't understand this. But anyway, uh, you're just grabbing on this rope. You get skis. It's pulling you up the hill so that you can come back down. And as you're going up the hill, uh, you're just hanging on for dear life. And you, it gets heavy. Your arms get tired. Well, there's a young teenager uh, going up the rope to one day. And he had a hoodie on. And that, that, uh, that rope slowly turns as it goes up the hill. And the, the, the strings from his hoodie started to slowly get tangled up. And as it get further and further up the hill, those, those strings get wrapped more around, his, uh, around the rope. So when it came time to get off the rope toe, you just let go and you ski off to the side. He let go and he started to ski off to the side. And then the... <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, strings just yanked him, and it's, you know, he couldn't see anything. He wasn't going anywhere. And he couldn't go where he wanted to go. He was bound. When I think of this verse, I think of that young man. Sin binds us. You might want to get out and go do something, but you're not going anywhere. And it keeps us from go, and going and serving the Lord as we want to. Let me ask you something. Are you bound to something this evening? Has something got a grip on you? Maybe it just slowly wrapped around your life. Just something slowly taking root. And then all of a sudden, boom, the lights went out. How did that happen? You just let it get to you and twist. Could be bitterness. Are you upset with somebody? Angry with somebody? I'll tell you, bitterness is a horrible, horrible thing. And if you're a bitter person, you're not going to be a very effective soul winner. You're not going to care about anybody but yourself. Someone's name comes up, and it's always, you just get upset. You get, uh, uh. You know how you know when you're bitter against somebody? When you're always building a case against them. Are you, are you critical? Are you covetous? Always grabbing for something? Are you just lazy? Maybe, the, maybe some entertainment's gotten a hold of you. The wrong music, the wrong videos. People getting destroyed by pornography all the time on, on their phones and in the internet. You get sin in your life, you're bound. Whew. 
You can't see. You're unable to serve the Lord. You're not even concerned about passing out tracts. We need to deal with sin. And not only makes us unable to serve, it makes us unfit to serve. If you would, uh, turn with me to Isaiah chapter number 6. Isaiah chapter number 6. Sin is a terrible thing. And as long as we allow sin in our lives, we're not going to be a, a soul winner. We're not going to be a witness. Oh, you can force some of that, but the Holy Spirit of God's not going to be working through you. In Isaiah chapter number 6, we all love verse number 8. It's a great missions verse, isn't it? Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And that is a great verse. But something preceded that. And what we see in verse 1 is Isaiah saw that God was holy. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. And with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Isaiah saw God. And you're not going to see God until you take some time and spend time with him. And as we get into the word of God in our devotional time and really spend time reading the word and pouring our heart out, we begin to see God. Devotions isn't about, God, give me everything I want. It's about, Lord, what do you want from me? We should be devoted to him. That's what devotions is about. And in verse number five, after he sees God for who he is, he saw himself for who he was. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. God was holy. He was sinful. And it's at that time when he saw himself for who he was and God for who he was, then he was able to be cleansed. Then he was able to be used. And then we see in verses 6 and 7 that he had to deal with his sin before he could see and help, um, before he could see the needs of others and help the needs of others. In verse number 6, then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which had, he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Until our sin is taken away and purged, we are not going to have the burden that we need. We're not going to have those tears for souls. We're not going to be, we're not going to care. We're going to be indifferent. We can go through the motions. But Almighty God's not going to work through us in a miraculous way until we deal with sin. And God wants us to deal with sin. You say, well, I'm burdened for my, I'd love for one of my family members to get saved. Well, take care of your sin. And maybe God can use you to reach him. We keep dabbling and playing with this and that. Get rid of it! Sin makes us unfit for service. Sometimes God doesn't use us because we're unclean. When I want to drink, I don't go in the, to the sink where all the dirty dishes are and spotted and everything else. I go get a nice clean one. God's the same way. He wants clean vessels and that's what he uses. So sin makes us unable to serve. It scars us. It makes us unfit for service. And then sin also makes us unconcerned about souls. Like I said, scars uh, make our skin insensitive, right? When I drove into that dump truck at, you know, 60-something miles an hour and, uh, you know, hit my head, I still have, a, still have a scar up here. And, you know, I don't have the same feeling there that I used to have. Not that I ever had much feeling up in my head anyway. Regular numbskull. I know you wanted to say it, so I said it for you. 
Why do we lack a burden for souls? Why do we not really care about the spiritual need of others? Because we lack compassion. That's what it is. Matthew 24, verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Why do I not care about someone who's lost that's going to go somewhere when they die? Why would I have a lack of compassion? Why would you have a lack of compassion? The Bible says it right there. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of ma- what many shall wax cold. We have a lack of love because we have an abundance of sin. A lack of a burden is proof that there's sin. And we're so insensitive to it. We're scarred by sin. The devil's pretty crafty. He gets us off base. He gets us, you know, AWOL. We're not doing what we ought to do. Sin causes us to focus on ourselves instead of on others. It's a horrible thing. And the reason we may not be winning souls is because sin may have a grip on our lives. If that's the case, if the Lord has convicted you of something, I hope that you will take time to confess that to him. But that's not the only way the devil wounds us. Wounded warriors, we could be scarred by sin. Secondly, we could be sidelined by suffering. It might not be some glaring sin, sin problem in your life. Maybe you're suffering. How many here like to suffer? If you do, then there's something different about you. <laughs> I don't like to suffer. Few of us enjoy it, but God said not to be surprised when it happens. Well, if you would, please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter number 4. We shouldn't be surprised... First Peter chapter number 4, verses 12 and 13. I was preparing a message out of this text. I just mentioned that the car accident that we had. I was preparing a message out of this text and finished it the day before we had that car accident. <laughs> Here it is. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But, what's the next word? Rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. He said, don't be surprised when you have suffering. Now go back to verses 1 and 2 with me. Chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath what? Ceased from sin. Then verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. Do you see, suffering here can help us put our focus back on the Lord so that we can have victory over sin. Suffering helps us to do the will of God. Suffering's not a bad thing. It's not a pleasant thing, but it's not a bad thing. And when God brings trials into our lives and we go through a time of suffering, sometimes it's physical suffering, sometimes it's emotional suffering, it's never easy. It's hard. Let me ask you, any time you ever want to quit? Man, I've wanted to throw in the towel, towel I don't know how many times. <laughs> However, suffering should cause us, and that's how God's put it here, should cause us to focus on him and help us to have victory over sin, but sometimes we don't handle those sufferings the right way, and you know what we end up doing? Instead of focusing on the Lord, we start focusing on our troubles. Ooh. Now it's all about me. It's not about God anymore. 
my focus just changed, the suffering. And so the devil loves to heap on suffering. He loves to heap on trouble and say, well, if I can't get them with sin, I'll get some good, dedicated Christian who's serving God. I'll just throw some suffering at him and see if I can get him signed line that way. Let him just focus on all his troubles so he'll be no good to the Lord. He won't feel like passing on a track. I know you've never been there, right? I mean, there's been times I've just been so miserable. I don't, I don't feel like doing anything. Give a track? Pfft. Come on, be honest. There's time you don't you don't feel like giving a track to somebody. Sometimes you're, you're you know you want Jesus loves you, but and you're thinking in your heart, but I don't even know if he loves me. I, you know he loves you, but sometimes you get sidetracked, don't you? We all do, and we hesitate to do. Sometimes, uh, let me just say this. Sometimes when, we're, when we witness, people get hurt. People get hurt. You witness to a family, a loved one, family member, and they make fun of you. Or they say, why are you judging me? And they'll say mean things sometimes. And you get hurt. And what happens when you get hurt? You become reluctant at doing those things that cause pain to you in the first place. Right? We hesitate to do what causes us pain and problems. So passing out that track, someone refuses it. Knocking on the door and people getting angry. Witnessing to relatives, whatever. And, and, um, and they tell you that they just don't want to hear it anymore. And sometimes we suffer for doing what's right. And we don't want to go through that suffering again, so we just won't do it. And the devil says, ah, I got it. I wounded them. They're sidelined by suffering. That's just what I wanted to do. Paul was, he, he suffered for doing what's right. Go with me to Acts chapter number 14. Doubtful any of us are going to have the sufferings that he had for the cause of Christ and for <laughs> sharing his faith. In Acts chapter 14, if you would, look with me in verses 20 and 21. I want you to see something here. Acts 14, verses 20 and 21. How be it, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. Uh, in verse number 21. And when they had preached the gospel to that city... And had taught many, he returned to, now get these three cities, Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. Say, okay, uh, I didn't see anything there, Brother Olson. What's the big deal? He went to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. Yay! It actually was a big deal. Because some pretty terrible things happened in those cities before he went back to them. If you would look with me in verse 19, uh, we'll see in Lystra. And there came thither Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. You know what happened in Lystra? They tried to kill him. They stoned him, and they, they threw stones, large stones, many stones, knocked him unconscious. He was so banged up that they actually thought he was dead. And they were rejoicing. Yeah, we killed him. <laughs> and he went back to Lystra. I don't know about you, but if there's a bunch of people wanting to kill me and have already tried, mm, don't know if I want to go back there. But he did. He didn't let suffering stop him. Now, Iconium, verses 4 and 5, was where he was assaulted and they conspired against him in, in the beginning. And then even 
earlier in uh, chapter 13, verses 45 and verse 50 in Antioch, he was kicked out. So he was kicked out in Antioch. Then he was assaulted and conspired against in Iconium. And then these people from Antioch and Iconium come to Lystra and stir up the people at Lystra and try to kill them there. And Paul said, hey, let's go back to those three cities. I think we'd have a good time. Suffering. Did the devil sideline Paul through suffering? Nope. Paul kept going. That's New Testament Christianity. Christianity in our century is, oh, I got a headache. Oh, I get to work overtime. Well, sorry. <laughs> we'll go some other time. Yeah. Second Corinthians, if you would, with me. Second Corinthians chapter 12. I'm not done talking about Paul. Paul's one of my heroes. Second Corinthians chapter number 12, verse 15. Here's Paul. He said, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. So here's Paul, the Apostle Paul. He's loving people. He's sacrificing. He's spending his, his own substance. But more than that, he's being spent. He's literally spending his life and they don't even appreciate it. And what was his reaction? He, so he's suffering for helping people. He's suffering for loving people. And what's his reaction? I will very, very gladly spend and be spent. Oh. Puts things in a little different perspective, doesn't it? Here's the devil. Throwing his fiery darts. He wants to sidetrack. He, he wants to scar you with sin. If he can't do that, he's going to try his best to sideline you through suffering. Have you suffered in some way from serving the Lord? So it's just not fair. I've, I've served God and a lot of terrible things happened to me. I can say the same thing. I had to listen to my own preaching. I, I, wrote, I wrote that book. Brighter days ahead. And after I wrote that book, there were some real terrible dark times that came into our lives. We had some dark times before that, but there were some dark times. And I got to thinking, Lord, that's not fair. I did this and this and this right, and you let this and this, this happen. That's not fair. And then God said, what about that chapter in the book you wrote? And I remembered the chapter, it's not God's fault. I said, all right, Lord. It's not your fault. And by God's grace, I got back up, dusted myself off and said, all right. And that week, I don't know, I, I gave out so many gospel tracts that week and talked to people. It was just a blessing. It wasn't going to be that way at first. <laughs> I, was getting, I was on my way to being sidelined. Let me just say this. You're going to be hurt. You're going to suffer. Please do not go into self-protection mode. You're not going to reach anybody for the Lord. Someone in here is hurting tonight, I'm sure. And you're questioning God. You're questioning everything. And you're not focused on others. We've got to get over this. Fairhaven Baptist Church, we've got to get over this. And when we do, we'll see God greatly bless.
The devil hates our church. He's zeroing in on you. He wants you scarred by sin. He wants you sidelined by suffering. And then lastly, he wants you silenced by sorrow. Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20. I want you to see Jeremiah here. What happened to him in his response? In verse, chapter 20, verse number 1, Now Pasher, the son of Immer, the, the priest, who was also chief governor in the house of the Lord, so this is a religious man, okay, heard that Jeremiah prophesied these things. Then Pasher smote Jeremiah, the prophet. Now wait a minute. Here's one of the religious leaders smacking Jeremiah around because Jeremiah is preaching the word of God and put him in the stocks. They were in the high place of the uh, high, high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. Not only does he smack him and smite him, but now he puts him in the stocks. It's a painful place. Not only a painful place, but it's a shameful place. People walk by, <laughs> he's in the stocks. Laughing at him, making fun of him. I don't know about you, but I'd be like, Lord, I was serving you. I, you know, spoke for you, and this is what happens because of this. Well, fine, I'm not going to talk anymore. Verse number seven. <laughs> That's where he got to. <laughs> O oh Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. I'm done. If that's what I get for serving you, I'm done. I'm not talking for you anymore. Now, unless you get too hard on him, you know, he was wrong, but we get that way too, don't we? He got focused on himself instead of on God's message. I'm not going to speak anymore for you. Grief and sorrow really can do a number on us. And everyone handles grief and sorrow a little differently. But one way grief and sorrow can affect us is it causes us to withdraw. We just get away from people. We withdraw from service. We feel sorry for ourselves. Don't want to be around people. Certainly don't want to be around anybody else and help anybody. It's been exciting over the years to be able to work with the, the shun, Sunshine Girls. They're a blessing. Learn a lot from them. Even I learned from them how I was dealing with grief that I didn't even know about as I was studying to help them with grief. And God says, hey, you needed that. It's like, ooh. One thing I've learned, though, as I studied and taught on grief over the years, is that you can't allow it to silence you and to, and to get you with, to withdraw. You've got to get engaged. The only way to overcome grief, one of the only ways, let me say it this way, is to get involved and help somebody else. When you start giving back to other people, you'll start seeing that God is working through you once again. And you start feeling and sensing God's presence. And, but too often, sil uh, sorrow silences us. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter 16. Yes, we're getting close to finishing. Acts chapter number 16. Paul, he had a lot of grief throughout his ministry. 
We look at him and say, man, this guy's a great hero. But would you have really have liked living the life he lived and going through all that he went through? He was always going through problems. Here we are. We see him. He's preaching the word of God, and they arrest him, and then they abuse him. And here he is sitting in jail in Acts 16, verse 22. And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely, who, having received such a charge, thrust him into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. Ah. Again. Why? Serving God. Do I got problems when I serve God? Sometimes you'll have more problems when you serve God. Well, then I'm not going to serve God. Well, then you're going to even have more bigger problems without God's help. So may as well just serve God and get his help. How did he react? Verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And we know the rest of the story. God sent a great earthquake. There was divine intervention. <laughs> Some guy says, what must I do to be saved? And they preach the gospel. The guy gets saved. His whole house gets saved. Exciting. Never would have happened if they were feeling sorry for themselves and remained silent. They just, they just kept praising God. And it turned into an opportunity for God to work through them. You're going to go through troubles. Someone might have a very heavy heart tonight. Stop focusing on self. Praise God in the midst of your trial. And look for others who have needs. Here's a man who had a greater need, this Philippian jailer, about ready to kill himself. No hope. And Paul and Silas said, let us tell you what you need. Make yourself available to God. The devil's out to get us. He wants to scar us by sin, sideline us through suffering, and silence us through sorrow. And he's doing a pretty good job. But we can have victory. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Always, not just when things are easy. If we deal with our sin, we'll be able to get back to serving God. Peter said, 1 Peter 5, 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He's out. He's on the prowl. He wants to wound Christian soldiers. So, let's suit up. Let's seek the Lord. Let's get back in the fight. Let's see what God will do. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. The devil wants you sidelined. What has hindered you from ser serving the Lord, from witnessing from him, for him? Has it been sin? Is it suffering?